have, and uh, as these weeks come, we're going to be unfolding a specific direction uh, for our church. We exist to see lives change through the lives of change people. While praying for you this week, two things hit me. I know we have faith and we believe in God and we want Jesus to do the impossible and the miraculous, and he can and he will, but there's something the Holy Spirit told me that may or may not resonate with you. It just is what it is. I'm your pastor and I'm going to say it. He told me, he said, this year will only move at the speed of you. Now, you can take that how you want, but I asked him for more clarity because I'm like, Lord, what you mean? Like, <laughs> if this year going to move at the speed of me, you know, I'm kind of slow, fam. So I need, you to, I need you to tell me what the dealio is. And he spoke this, this next line. He says, if you're the same, everything else will also be. So, so we can sit and we can praise God for change, tell our neighbor that God's getting ready to change or whatever. But nothing's going to change if we stay the same. And so we want to begin this year transformationally. We want to begin this year in the mindset that this is the year God wants to do some stuff in me before he does some stuff around me. Do me a favor. Tell somebody next to you to say, let him work in you. Let's look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5, and I'm going to pull out one verse, verse number 14. Then I'm going to talk to you about what I want to talk to you about, and we're going to get into it. This may be two parts because I'm not going to hold you long. 14 in the Passion Translation says this. A short time later, Jesus found the man at the temple and said to him, look at you now. <laughs> You're healed. Look at you now. You're healed. That's good, ain't it? Huh? Walk away from your sin so that nothing worse will happen to you. <laughs> so Jesus starts out good. He says, look at you. Look at you with your cute self. You are healed. Thank you, Jesus, for my healing. But in that healing, make sure you walk away from that sin. Oh, God, or something worse is going to happen. I, I want to talk to you from the series, Not the Same. That's our series, and we're going to sit in that bad boy as long as the Lord says. But the message I want to talk to you from is change or die. <laughs> Tell somebody next to you, say change or die. Oh, my God, you're healed, but walk away from that sin because you think you were sick before. But if you don't walk away from that thing I healed you from, it could get ten times worse. In his book, Change or Die, author Alan Deutschman's position begins with a question. He says this. He says, what if you were given this choice, the choice to change or die? If you didn't change, your time would end soon, a lot sooner than it had to. Could you change when change matters most? Deutschman concludes that although we all have the ability to change our behavior, we rarely ever do. The most shocking and sobering evidence he presented was when he talked about patients whose arteries are so clogged that any kind of exertion is beyond painful for them. So surgeons, he says this, so surgeons have to implant pieces of plastic to prop open their arteries or remove veins from their legs to stitch near the heart so blood can bypass the blocked passages. 
The procedures are painful, expensive, and traumatic. They can cost more than $100,000. And although these surgeries are necessary, they are no more than temporary fixes. And he intrigued me this. He says, the surgery only relieves the patient's pain for a while, but only fewer than 3% of the cases prevent the heart attacks they're headed toward or prolong their lives. And this is the part that got me already. He said, if you look at people after coronary artery bypass grafting two years later, 90% of them have not changed their lifestyle. 90%. And that has been studied over and over and over again. Even though they know they have a bad disease. Even though they know they should change their lifestyle. Even though they know that they are on their way to death for whatever reason, they don't change. So 90% of people facing death, 90% cannot sustain a change in lifestyle. Essentially, what they're saying is, they're saying they would rather die than change. Did you hear what I said? In our text this weekend, we're presented with an instance by the gospel writer John that is the third sign in this gospel that points toward Jesus being the Son of God. John's gospel carefully constructs and lays out the reality and truth of the divine nature of Jesus. Ultimately, John's gospel is written for those who have not seen. So John presents evidences that support the truth of Jesus being the promised Messiah that would come and save his people. John's gospel is different than the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In their gospels, they present the teachings of Jesus as sermons. In John's gospel, he presents the teachings of Jesus more like conversations and in this we see the revelation of God as the one who cares enough to converse and is touchable by those seeking transformation so the first place I want to thing I want to tell you is you're in the right place for transformation tell somebody next you say you're in the right place for transformation Jesus is tangible transformation. No matter what you're faced with, no matter what's taking place in your life, no matter who walked out in your life, no matter what scenario you're looking at in your life, finances, marriage, heart, unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, whatever the case may be, you are in the right place for transformation because Jesus is tangible transformation. When you meet Jesus, you meet transformation. So in the text, we see Jesus has arrived at a place, Jordan, called Bethsaida. Everybody say Bethsaida. Beth, Bethesda, I mean, Bethesda, rather. Bethesda means house of mercy. Everybody say house of mercy. And in the context of this text, this text, this place is filled with sick people. And all these sick people are on these five porches. They're called called the porches of this big pool uh, at Bethesda, Bethesda. And they're all waiting on the troubling of the water. They were subterranean uh, springs. Let me give you the context. That would come up underneath this pool and it would trouble the water. And so they didn't have scientific studies back then. So anything that was out of the norm, they put a superstitious thing to it. But what they didn't realize is these were springs underneath the water that would come up and sometimes they would have medicinal properties. And so John emphasizes this superstition in this verse to set up what's coming. The text shifts from speaking in general terms to speaking in specificities by turning our attention to a particular brother who's been sick for 38 years. And not only is he sick, but he's surrounded by a whole bunch of sickness. And the text says that everybody around him is in the same or worse condition than he is. And the first thing I want to suggest to you is that just like sickness, freedom has an environment. Y'all miss what I said. Sickness has an environment and freedom has an environment. The scripture says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we misquote that and we don't understand what it means. What it's really saying is where the spirit of the Lord is Lord, there is freedom. There is no bondage that can withstand you making a declaration and decisions that align with the truth that Jesus is Lord. But... This man dwelled in a place where bondage was normal. (laughs) 
He was sick. Everybody was sick. His mama was sick. His daddy was sick. His whole legacy was sick, so he was going to be sick. This guy dwelt in a place where sickness and bondage was normal. It was normal to be sick for him. It was normal to be paralyzed. It was normal to beg to people and depend on the mercy of other people. What in your life has become common that you know God wants to kill? I want to ask you a question on this first Sunday of 2020. What in your life are you settling on being common that you know Jesus wants to kill? Is it laziness? Uh Uh-oh. Is it laziness? Are you just not motivated? You know, I'm just not. Is it it apathy? Is it the fact that you just don't care? Is it a critical spirit? And nothing is ever right. Something is always wrong. Somebody is always wrong. What in your life has become normal that God wants to take out of your life? Those things may be the norm in your kingdom, but they are foreign intruders to the kingdom of God. And one of the greatest enemies to exceptional is normal. Everybody say normal. So what is Jesus doing to this brother? And I believe Jesus is going to do this for us this year. Jesus showed up to confront this sick man's sense of normalcy. I believe that this is the year God is coming to redefine normal for you. What do you mean? God is a pattern breaker. He is a system interrupter. He is a generational pattern breaker. I don't care what daddy was. It don't have to be you. I don't care what mama and them do. You don't got to do it. They can sit around and be messy, but you don't have time for that. There's a destiny inside of your spirit. And Jesus confronts this man's normal. What is your normal? What is your pattern? Somebody been caught up in patterns of disappointment. Patterns of abuse, patterns of discontentment, patterns of discouragement. Life has taught you that there is a certain pattern you need to expect. This is what life says, don't get too happy because soon it's going to all come crashing down. Don't celebrate too long because in a minute your joy is about to be robbed. Somebody say pattern. Jesus steps into this man's world to confront his pattern. He confronts his normal. And I don't know about you, but my prayer for you over the past three days while being trapped in a hotel room is God interrupt their patterns. God, whatever pattern they've accepted as normal, interrupt it because God is going to reteach you through confrontation that there are no cycles strong enough to keep you stuck. Can I preach to somebody in here who just needed that word to start this new year that this cycle you see is not stronger than God, that there is no cycle of sin strong enough, there is no cycle of anger strong enough, there is no generational pattern strong enough to keep you stuck in a place God is getting ready to get you out of God told me to tell you he said I want to give them new normals new normals he says I want your normal to be worship not worry he said I want your normal to be praise not problems he said I want your normal to be when stuff hits you You look at the joy instead of the craziness. You say, God, this thing is about to work some greater glory in me. And so I may not like it, but I praise you for, can I talk to somebody in here who needed a perspective shift in 2020? That things may happen to me, but they also happen for me. That this year, the stuff that comes in my life, I'm not about to lose my joy. Why? Because life ain't give me joy. Jesus did. And if life gave me joy, it could take away joy. But since I ain't get joy from there, not not one of y'all, none of y'all can steal my joy. So I'll walk in this year expecting the blessing. Even if the enemy tries something slick, I still have joy. Somebody say, that's my new normal. Jesus showed up, but Jesus showed up to interrupt this brother's normal while he was in sickness and surrounded by sickness. Understand, grace showed up 
at the worst place it could. In the midst of filth, you got to understand this picture. Listen, look at this picture. Usually there were hundreds of sick people on this particular pool. But because it was a feast, there's probably 3,000 people who are sick, who are lame, who are busted, disgusted, who have boils and are oozing, who are sitting in their own feces and body excrements. And grace showed up in the midst of all of that. And I know there's somebody here thinking, I'm too bad. I'm too broken. I'm too filthy. I'm too far gone. I'm too dirty. This situation is beyond God's hand. I'm here to tell you, grace always finds a way. Look at what Jesus did. Nobody would go that close to people that sick. But the first thing the text says Jesus did is Jesus walked into the mural of messes and brought miracles because grace finds a way. Watch this. Not only does grace find a way, but is there a witness in here that if grace can't find a way, grace will make a way. Can I preach to somebody in here that there was no way out of what you were looking at but somehow you looked up and there was Jesus in the midst of your storm with you and you don't even know how he got there it's because if grace can't find it grace will make it can I preach to somebody in here who needs hope for this year Grace is going to make a way. You don't have to stay sick. You don't have to stay down. You don't have to stay bound. Grace is meeting you. Not only does grace find a way, not only does grace make a way, but grace is the way. I don't know if there's anybody like me. You may see me up here, and I got this little leather jacket on or whatever, and I got this microphone on my ears. I'm up here talking, and it looks like I got everything together, but you could ask my wife. That is far from the truth. You could ask my wife how crazy I am, but somehow grace won't leave me alone. It's somehow Jesus keeps telling me that what I put in you is way more valuable than anything you can do to set. Can I talk to somebody in here? who be sabotaging your own pathway, but Jesus don't even let you get in the way of you. I wish you would slap somebody a high five and say grace is the way. If it, if it had not been for the Lord who was on my side, where would I? There's somebody here who got mug shots and police reports to prove that you should not be sitting in this place right now. But grace made a way. I call that a divine infiltration. It's when Jesus becomes your grace place in the middle of that gross place. And you can look at me like you don't have a gross place all you want. But Jesus knows your gross place. But still grace comes and finds you in the midst of that gross place to let you know that you're living below your means, that you are, you are living below your, below your value, that you are living below the destiny I have. Question I got is, are you willing to be the one who's so sick of being sick that you let Jesus change you right in the middle of that mess? Are you sick of being sick? Are you sick and sick of your sick environments? Because sickness has an environment just like freedom. And so John chapter 5, verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned, I gotta, I, I'm going somewhere. That was all my intro. Y'all still with me? Wave at me if you're still with me now. Wave at me. Come on. All the way in the back. Wave at your boy. Holler at your boy. All right, let's go. When Jesus, verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him this question. Jesus, with his disrespectful behind, he says, hey, cuz. Do you want to be well? Oh, my God, that is so mean of my Savior. Jesus walked up to a visibly sick, stanking man who had been sick for 38 years and asked him, do you really want to change? <sighs> that seems like a rude question. And I want to be rude right with Jesus and ask you the same thing. 
Do you even want to change? What, what, what you mean? Sometimes you could be down so long that getting up ain't even on your mind. You're just trying to survive another day. But I'm going to ask you, because I believe the Spirit of God is asking me to ask you, do you want to change? And some of y'all are like, well, that's why I'm here. What you mean do I want to change? That's why I showed up. What you mean? That's why I sat through all this worship and I'm sitting up in here listening to you, fool. That's why what you mean? What kind, of, what kind of question is that? And I honestly don't think many people understand what they're asking for when they're asking for change. What most people want are the instantaneous results of change without the incremental adjustments of change. I'm going to say that again for some of y'all who's slow. I'm slow too, but you're worth waiting on. Here you go. I don't think we really understand what we're saying when we're saying God changed me. Because most of us want the instantaneous results change brings without doing the, or making the incremental adjustments for change to take place. Listen, to change means to now be responsible for a world you have not known. The Lord, I said, I said, God, what do you mean? He said, I know you can handle the result, but can you handle the responsibility? When we say we won't change, we just won't change. We don't want adjustments. Can you fortify? He said this. He said, can you fortify your spirit enough to resist the temptation to go backwards? He said, are you willing to suffer through the temporary pain of the adjustments for the eternal joy of fellowship with God? Here's one. Here's one. Oh, this, gonna, this, this one's mean. And I said, Lord, what you mean? He said, I'm about to tell you. He says, he says son, he said, ask him. He says, are you ready for the responsibility that comes with change? Watch this. When all you're used to is the attention that comes from bondage. I said, God, what you mean? He says, some people don't really want change, son. I said, why? He says, because they get too much attention in their affliction. I said, God, what do you mean? He said, the issue has become their identity. And the people around them know it because they say stuff like, oh, you know, that's just how he is. Oh, here she come. You already know what that means. Oh, leave it alone. You know, that's just it. And God says, some people don't want to change because they get too much attention afflicted. So when Jesus asked this man that question, he means it. Are you done allowing this sickness to be your identity? And I'm asking you the same thing. Are you done allowing that sickness to be your identity? Whatever that struggle is, it's not who you are. Whatever that situation was, it does not define you. But Jesus is asking, are you ready to take on the responsibility it takes to operate in this place you've never known? Somebody sitting in here right now with an identity issue and don't even know it. Let's look at this man's response. Do you really want to get well? Let's look at it. Verse 7. Sir, he replied, I ain't got nobody to help me into the pool when the water stirs. So while I'm trying to get in, somebody asks, gets down, somebody gets down ahead of me. You won't change, real quick. But in this conversation are three reasons why it's not going to happen. First thing he said is, I ain't got nobody to help me. Write this down. The first reason change ain't going to happen for you is write this word down, excuses. I'm going to be real with you today. 
excuses. He said, I don't got nobody. I don't have no help. I don't have any help. Nobody loves me enough to help me. There's nobody who's helping me. I just need help. If somebody would just, everybody else is getting help and nobody else is getting help. This man wasn't just crippled in his legs. He's obviously crippled in his mind. He essentially said, the reason I'm not healed is because I don't have any help. The answer to all of his issues was standing right in front of him. But his focus wasn't on who was there. His focus on who wasn't there. I'm going to say that again till you hear it in your shana now. Everything this man could have ever wanted is standing right in front of him. Instead of receiving who was there, his focus was too much on who wasn't there. I'm going to say it again for this side because this side got it, but this side, y'all slow. I'm going to got you. Everything he needed was in the room. Everything he needed was looking at him in his face. Everything he needed was able to heal him and touch him and change him and rearrange him and pick him up and turn him around and place his feet on solid ground. But his focus was off. His focus was not on who was there. His focus was on who wasn't there. And I want to preach to 55 people in here who that was your focus all last year. You cried yourself to sleep. You threw all kind of pity parties. You walked around in all kind of unforgiveness and bitterness because of the people who weren't there when the one who has always been there was standing right there, ready to heal every area you felt they could have healed. Lean on somebody and say he's in the room. God told me to tell you this year, don't keep what you don't have away from what you do have. God told me to tell somebody and try not to shout that he's placed some stuff in your life that you're getting ready to use. While you Watch this. While you think you need a sword and a shield, God said, I just put three rocks in your life. And all you got to do is pick up one of those rocks and have enough faith to throw it at that giant that you wish. Where are the Davids at in this room? That says, I ain't got to use nothing I don't have. But whatever I have in my life is enough. To do what God has called me to do. I don't have no help. Somebody say excuses. Yes. He said, not only do I don't have no help, but I don't have no help. And the people around me know I don't have no help. And that's why I'm not in the water. That's why I didn't get healed. He essentially said, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Somebody else did something to me. That's why I'm in this situation. See, Pastor, if I was like you and I grew up with both of my parents, I wouldn't be like this. Pastor, see, if I was like them and, and I, just needed, I just need one more zero on my check, just one. I ain't asking God for two more zeros. Just God, I'm just, how hard is that for God to just break into a system and add an extra zero, two, three, four, five, six times. Let me catch up on my bills, then I'll be good. We can go back to normal. If I, if I just, if I just, if, if, if God just bypassed the system, if God just did something miraculous for me. It's not my fault. You think I asked to be born like this? It's not my fault. You think I asked for this to be my problem? Why couldn't lying be my problem? I, th- I want to be a liar. I don't want to deal with this sexual stuff. I'd rather drink than deal with this sexual addiction. Why this got to be my issue? Why I got to hide while I'm watching my laptop? Why? Why are there passcodes on everything because I'm afraid of what somebody may discover? Why? Why is it that I give my body away just because I don't want to be lonely? Why that got to be my issue? I wish I had money problems. Why does that? Why? Why is that? It's, it's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. I ain't asked my uncle to touch me like that. I ain't asked my cousins to be sexually explorative with me. I didn't ask, like, the reason I'm the way I am is because of them. All the while, we make excuses to stay sick. Healing is on the other side of responsibility. Do you want to change? All the man had to do was say, yes. 
Jesus didn't ask him who did it. Jesus didn't ask him what happened. Jesus didn't ask him if it hurt. Jesus knew the answer to that, so Jesus said, do you want to change? His response was give an excuse. So the first enemy to change this year is excuses. The second one is, he says, while I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes down ahead of me. Reason number two. Reason number one is excuses. Reason number two, write this down, effort. Effort. Write that down. Like I said before, it got normal. It got normal to the boy. He got comfortable. That boy got super comfortable. He's like, I'm just going to be sick and stay sick. It is what it is. I guess this is just my life. This is just my life. Ain't nothing going to change. It's always going to be the same. No matter how much I climb out, I just get pushed right back in. Effort. Effort doesn't mean it's all on me. Effort means I'm going to do things that resemble the life I want, not the one I'm being set free from. Did you hear what I said? Effort doesn't mean if I, it's all on me. Effort means I'm going to start to do stuff that looks like the future I want. Effort means I'm going to start talking like the future I want. Effort means I'm going to start kicking it with people who look like the future I want. Effort means I'm going to do everything I can and sit back and watch God do everything I can. Somebody say effort. Ephesians 4.1 says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. God says you've received something, and now by the Spirit of God, God is calling you to walk like what you receive. That's not fronting, that's faith. Not I will be healed, I am healed. Not I will be delivered, I am delivered. Not this is turning around, this has turned around. This is not some mystic, whatever I say can change God. This is putting my words in agreement with God's words. Because God says I'm already set free. So my actions need to line up with what God has said and not with what I see. And in 2020, I want to preach to 15 people who woke up this morning and came into this church. Because you know, you know that your future looks way better than what you're looking at now. And you're saying I might as well get ready for what God is bringing in my life. Because what, he, what it ain't going to do is catch me by surprise. What you're not going to do is surprise me. God, I believe you so much that I'm about to set my life up in such a way that when you bless me, not if you bless me, when you bless me, this year I'm not going to waste it like I did every other year. I'm about to get my credit together. I'm about to erase numbers. I'm about to delete friends. I'm about to do everything I need to do so when you open up a window on me, Who am I preaching to? Just the people I'm preaching to. Go shake somebody's hand and say, you better get ready. Look at them and say, you better get ready. Say, don't squander it, not another year. That when God does it this time, I'm going to be ready for it. At least I'm going to be ready for whatever I can handle because he says he'll pour out a blessing that I won't have room enough to receive, which means what? That the people connected to me is going to be blessed off the overflow of what he does in my... Slap somebody high five and say, you better get ready for it. Look at them and say, wipe those tears off your face. Wash your face off. Put on your best shoes and stand in the truth that God will never leave you. Nor will he forsake you. That this is the year. Somebody say, I'm ready this year. I ain't going to waste it this year. I ain't going to wonder this year. It's going to happen this year. And when it happens, only God is going to get the glory. Somebody say effort. Who believes it's going to happen? Whatever you believe in God for, I prophetically declare over you right now that you're going to start to see evidence of stuff turning around this month. It ain't going to be like this year where you had to wait till November, December to at least see something move. 
I'll prophetically declare that January, February, you're going to start to see stuff a little different. You're going to be starting to look at stuff like that wasn't there where I left it at. My, my joy is a little different this month. I, I used to be crying around this time last year, but I got joy on the inside of my soul that I can't even explain. Let me help you. He says he'll give you peace that surpasses all understanding. I don't know about y'all, but I need it. I need God to show me a little something. Lean on somebody and say, show me something. Just, God, I believe you in all that and I trust you. But sometimes my eyes need to see what my spirit been longing for. And I believe the evidence you need just need a little effort. You need to start acting like you blessed. You need to start acting like you healed. You need to start acting like you're an entrepreneur. You need to start making business plans, fake hiring employees, having conversations on how to fire people. Start taking care of the branding and marketing now. Because when the door opens, you may not have the time to be trying to go backwards when God is trying to get you to move forward. Slap somebody high five and say, get the plan together. Oh, I'm preaching to somebody in here better than y'all shouting. But if you would take 15 seconds in this place and start thanking God for stuff that ain't even happened yet that you are ready for. Y'all, some of y'all still can't shout because you know, you, you think that's fake. That ain't fake. That's called partnership with the prophetic. Some of the stuff that's been spoken over your life, you think it's just going to automatically happen. I'm here to tell you that sometimes you got to partner with a word and say, God, it don't look like it's going to change, but you said it was going to change. So I'm going to act like it is changed. God, they don't look like they're going to come to you, but you said they're going to come to you. So I'm going to praise them like they already belong to you. God, it don't look like it's going to turn around, but you said you've already turned it. So I'm about to act like it's turned. As a matter of fact, I'm turned because it's turned. Take 10 seconds to praise him right now. This ain't front. This is, this is partnership. Don't let the devil talk you out of it either. Look at you with your foolish self. Ain't nothing even happening. Ain't nothing. You know you're going to be embarrassed once again. You know you don't have the degree that you need. Look at all this Sally Mae debt that you got. You, ain't a, you know ain't nothing. Y'all ain't going to get no house. I know you and your husband believe in God for a house, but y'all going to stay in that apartment, y'all's whole marriage, and y'all marriage ain't going to change. And you know you and your husband about to get a divorce because y'all not about to get back together. It is what it is. You stupid. You're going to look stupid, and you is stupid, and you not smart, and you dumb, and I can't stand you, and God hates you. But you want to know how he gets himself in trouble every time? Jesus let the cat out the bag. Jesus said he's the father of lies. Watch this. Jesus said everything he says is lies. You want to know why he helps you believe? If he says it ain't going to happen. What does it mean? It's about to happen. And some of y'all been believing Satan for too long. You've been believing the words of your past for too long. 
You've been believing the words that people spoke over you for too long. But I'm here to tell you that there are greater words spoken over you. That God says, I have a plan for you. I know the thoughts that I think of you. Thoughts of good and not of evil. To give you an expected end. It's okay to believe God for big stuff. Somebody say effort. Last one and we got to go home. Number three. The third reason. First reason was excuses. We got to go. Second reason was effort. Then he says, I, know I have nobody help me get in when the pool is stirred. Everybody say when the pool is stirred. Now I told you this was a superstitious guy. Anything they could not explain with science, because they didn't have the scientific technology that we have today, they just, just like us today, step on a crack. Some of y'all to this day don't split poles when you're walking on the sidewalk. You, you don't even know why. Matter of fact, I be making my wife come back around it. It's just, you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's just that crazy superstition. Or, or you can't walk underneath the ladder. Or, or what does it mean when a black cat passed by you, or, or some of y'all, watch this, this is what some of y'all did, ate y'all's black eye, <laughs> put salt on it, and threw some of the salt behind you. It's just, because your grandma used to do it. It's just superstition, stuff, stuff we just, we just want to believe. So that was his experience. The third reason, if you want it to change, why it won't change, it's not excuses, it's not effort, it's your experience. Write that down, experience. This guy is waiting for an angel, a.k.a. a religious experience that he's known. That's dangerous. And he said, son, I don't want my people to neglect a new move because their eyes are on an old one. Because he says, I'm showing up differently than they expect. And their past experience is an enemy to new change. He was looking for God to move the way he was used to God moving. His eyes were on the water. Jesus is here. Water is here. He's not looking at Jesus. He's looking at the water. Pastor, what does the water represent? God told me to tell you to take your eyes off the water. What does the water represent? More money, more influence, better friends, a better church, more books, an extra class. It's all water. It's all water. He was looking at the way he thought God would move while the actual move was standing in front of him, which means what? I want you to catch this and we're going home. Jesus is the move, not the actual move itself. Did you hear what I said? The move is to get you to see Jesus, but we want to see another move. I'll get healed if I see a move. This will change if I see a move when the mover was standing in front of him. He wanted the rain when he could have had the rain maker. He wanted the wave when he could have had the wave maker. He wanted the way made when he could have had the whole way maker. And I believe God told me to tell you that this year, hear me, I am the move you're looking for. Remember Peter had his eyes on the water when he had, should have had his eyes on Jesus? When he took his eyes off Jesus and put on the water, what happened? It started to sink. 
Here it is. The transformation you're seeking this year is not in who or what God uses to do it. It's in the God that did it. What do you mean? God doesn't need any of the things you think he needs to do what he's going to do in your life. All of the things you think you just need more of, that's water. That's water. If I just have more patience, that's water. Can I tell you that God don't even need your patience to move in your life? You need your patience. Patience is not money to God where you give him the currency of patience and he give you a blessing. God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless you anyway because I love you. You don't owe me anything. Everything's been paid. He says, you need what you're trying to give me. He says, you need the patience. He says, but this year I want you to know that anything you're thinking I can, I'm going to use to bless you, I'm not. I'm going to do things so antithetical to your experience this year. Then watch this. Verse 8. Then Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Get up, pick up your mat, and walk. Get up, pick up your mat. And walk. This has been your experience. Your experience has been anytime you need help, you get the help you thought you needed but you're left in the same condition you were before you got the help. What do you mean? There's somebody sitting here right now who you with somebody you don't care nothing about. You using them, they using you. Because you just wanted some help in an area you thought you needed help. And so you look good, you dress good, you smell good, you got a great job, but spiritually you look like this. The first thing Jesus says is, do you want to be healed? Do you want to change? That's rude. Then the second thing is just as rude. He said, get up. After the man just said, I can't walk. I can't walk because I can't walk. I can't do this. I can't be this. I can't have this. I can't change this. I can't overcome this. I'm going to be this my whole life. Jesus says, do you want to be whole? I ain't got nobody to help me. Get up! Did you not just hear? What does Jesus do? And Jesus is doing this to us today. Jesus tells him to do something that's antithetical to his experience. His experience has been not been able to get up. But Jesus tells him to do something and his mind has become impossible. I'm sure in his life, he's tried to will himself up. Man, this is your day. You're going to be able to get up. It's your day. It's going to change. This is your day. Look at yourself in the mirror and tell tell yourself how beautiful you are, how valuable you are. You don't need nobody. You don't need, ooh, you're just pretty all by yourself. 
God's got a blessing with your name on it. Things are turning around for you and nothing changed. So his get up is one thing. You ever tried to get yourself up? Your get up is one thing. But God's get up is something else. <laughs> oh God, help me. Help me preach this like I feel it in my soul. See, see, your get up can make you happy. But it goes away. His get up gives you joy that lasts forever. Your get up may change a moment. But his get up can change your mind. Your get up ain't enough to build a bridge from your present to your future. But his get up has enough strength in it for you to use it as a bridge from your now to your later. And Jesus says, get up. And immediately when Jesus said, get up, I think strength didn't come back to his legs first. A stronghold was broken over his mind first. <laughs> and I want to talk to somebody in here who you're looking at the parts of your life that need strength, but you're neglecting the thing in your head that needs to be destroyed. And so once he started to think different, because he heard a word, get up, all of a sudden. Now, mind you, this man hasn't walked for 38 years. So his legs was probably skinnier than mine. No muscle. No nothing. It hasn't supported any weight. But one word from Jesus can bypass processes. And there's somebody sitting in here right now who's intimidated by the process. You're intimidated by what you think it's going to take to change. All you think it's going to take to be rearranged and for it to turn around. I'm here to tell you all you need is one. All you need is one word from God. And that one word will put strength in places. Time says it can't go. And the strength can come back to his legs. And so he stands up and Jesus says, don't just get up. But I want you to look back at what you was laying on. And I want you to pick that up. I want you to pick that up. And I want you to walk. Wait, 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 wait. I would have just left it. If I could finally walk after 38 years, I wasn't thinking about the bed I was laying in. He says, the bed is just an important part of the miracle as the strength is to your legs. Because I need people to see you now carrying what you depended on for all these years. And can I preach to 100 people in here who will stand on your feet and lift your hands to your king of kings and say this is my year that I'm going to start to carry all the stuff I was laying on top of and I want you to praise God right now because you're not choosing death you're choosing change come on I can't hear you I can't hear you I can't hear you. I'm choosing change. I'm choosing change. I'm choosing Jesus. I'm choosing change. I'm choosing righteousness. I'm choosing holiness. I'm choosing God's plan for my... Somebody worship Him. 